Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. If you don't like your life, go home, have a meeting with yourself and think about what you have been thinking about. Instead of blaming it on everything else, have a meeting with yourself and just ask yourself if it's time for you to get rid of your stinking thinking. You know, it's one thing to have something by faith. It's another thing to have it in your experience. It's one thing to have it legally, as I call it. There are many blessings that are ours legally because Christ has died, his blood has been shed, he has sealed the new covenant in his blood, and as a born-again believer, we are joint heirs with him and we have an inheritance. It's ours legally, it's ours. But it's to possessing of it that sometimes becomes an issue for people. The Israelites came out of bondage in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. It's equivalent to being a slave to sin. God sent them a deliverer, Moses. He has sent us a deliverer, Jesus Christ. And we have come out of slavery to sin. They came out of slavery to Pharaoh and they headed for a place called the Promised Land. We come out of the bondage to sin and we hear all about the promises of God and we start learning how to appropriate them in our life. Well, the Israelites had to go through a place that the Bible calls the wilderness. It was an 11 day journey as the crow flies straight across that wilderness. However, it took them 40 long, miserable, painful years before some of them ever finally entered. Most of them did not, by the way. Of the several million people that came out, or about a million and a half, I think, with children, very few entered the Promised Land. Joshua, Caleb, and some of the children that were not at the age of accountability when God finally got fed up with them enough to say, you're not going to enter the Promised Land. Now. We look at their story and we shake our heads and think, how dumb, 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 dumb. If it was only an 11 day journey, how could it have taken you 40 years to get there? But we need to wake up and smell the roses tonight and realize that many of us have wandered around the same mountains over and over and over too long. And my word to you tonight is it's time to go through and move on quickly toward the promised land. So. They thought their enemies were the problem. It was the Ishmaelites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites, and we all have our own brand of ites. It may be the bad husbandites, the grouchy neighborites, the sicknessites, the povertyites, the bad pastites, but we've all got our own ites. And we think that they are our problem, the devilites. It's the devil, if he would leave me alone. If this, if that, if something else. But as I began to study many, many, many years ago and search this out more deeply, I realized that very clearly from Scripture we can learn that it was not their enemies that was their problem because you see God was on their side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? There's nothing in this world that can defeat us if God is for us. And God was on their side. He told them, if you will do what I'm telling you to, you can make a quick trip across this desert and enjoy my promises. But they did not do that. It wasn't their enemies, it wasn't the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, all the enemies that they were in. It wasn't the giants in the land. It was their wrong mindsets and their wrong attitude. They did not know how to think the way God wanted them to think. You absolutely can think your way out of bondage and think your way into freedom if you learn to think the way that God wants you to think. It is impossible to have victory and think bondage. It's impossible to be happy and think sadness and depression. It is impossible to be free from sin while you think that you are in bondage to sin. There's a great example of this found in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6 verse 2, Paul said, how can you live in sin when you're dead to sin? The Bible tells us that when Christ died, we died in him that he took sin to the cross 
and that we are dead to sin and alive to righteousness. You know what that means? There's a part of you, the born again part of you, does not want anything to do with sin. It's dead to sin. That's why now when you sin, it bothers you. Before you were born again, didn't bother you. You didn't care. You loved it. You enjoyed it. But once you get born again, now you have a new set of problems because you cannot comfortably sin anymore. It makes you miserable. So there's a part of you that doesn't want to sin. However, you're still carrying around the flesh, an unrenewed mind, wild, out of control emotions, and a stubborn will that has to be worked on by God and the Holy Spirit. That actually is our wilderness. Our soul, until it's renewed by the Word of God, is our wilderness. We have to learn how to let God, who is in our spirit, invade our soul. He doesn't want to just live in this little place in the spirit. He wants to get out into your mind, into your emotions, into your will, into your finances, into your relationships, into your entertainment, and he wants to finally be seen through you as a bright shining light so the world can say, that person's got something that I want. Come on, somebody give God praise. So Romans 6, 2 says we're dead to sin, but then Romans 6, 11 says, even so now consider yourself dead from sin and alive to righteousness. I love that because the word consider is a process of your mind. So you might as well say that in Romans 6, 2, it says you're dead to sin, but then Romans 6, 11, it says, so now think that you're dead to sin. Believe that you're dead to sin. So we'll say, I'm dead to sin and sing songs about being free in Christ, but then we're afraid of sin. We say we're addicted. We're this, we're that. I can't get over this. This is too hard. I can't overcome that. So we stay trapped in that wilderness area. We have to begin to think like God thinks and say what God says, and that's gonna help us fast track through the wilderness and begin to live in the promises of God. You, can control your thinking with God's help, a lot of help from the Holy Spirit, a lot of leaning on the Holy Spirit. You can control your thinking, but not until you learn to actually take an inventory of your thoughts, and I call it thinking about what you're thinking about. Where the mind goes, the man follows. If you don't like your life, go home, have a meeting with yourself, and think about what you have been thinking about. Instead of blaming it on everything else, have a meeting with yourself and just ask yourself if it's time for you to get rid of your stinking thinking. Amen. Set your mind and keep it set on right things. You know, one of the most popular, two of the most popular scriptures, I guess, that we use when we teach on the mind is 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, reasons, and theories, taking every thought captive under the obedience of Jesus Christ. So we know there's a battle in our mind, wrong thoughts, reasons, theories that don't agree with the Word of God, and the Bible gives us the responsibility of locating them and casting them down. Now, it's really not our responsibility by ourselves because when you start leaning on the Holy Spirit, all you gotta do is just say, God, I'm asking you to start making me aware when I'm thinking wrong thoughts. Just pray, God, make me aware every time I'm thinking wrong thoughts. Don't let me just sit around and think stupid stuff. Make me aware when I'm thinking bad thoughts. And so as you begin to pray like that, you'll begin to realize, well, I don't need to be thinking that. I shouldn't be thinking that. That's not in line with the Word of God. And the way those strongholds in our mind is torn down is by being a diligent student of the Word of God, which is part of what you're doing here tonight. I applaud you because you took a Friday night. I mean, party night, the work week is over, and you could have done all kinds of things. You could have been out spending your paycheck on something that wasn't gonna do you any good, or you could have been in all kinds of places you didn't need to be, or you could have stayed home on your couch because you were tired from working all week, but here you are out here, thousands of you all the way to the top of the building to study the Word of God and to worship Him. I applaud you. 
But I also have to tell you, and I don't mean to be discouraging, this is not enough to keep you walking in victory. You'll need to get up and study some more in the morning. Then pray some, then worship some. Go to church the next day, maybe go to church the next night. Go to midweek service next week. Watch my TV program all five days next week. Get something on your iPad, get something on your iPhone. Just keep studying the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. And pretty soon you begin to think in a completely different way. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, completely changed by the entire renewal of your mind. So you can prove for yourselves what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> Jeremiah 4.14 says, How long shall your grossly offensive thoughts lodge within you? <laughs> I love that. Jeremiah 4.14, How long shall your grossly offensive thoughts lodge within you? So. The first thing that I located that I felt like was a problem for the Israelites that contributed to them taking so long to get to victory and also why many of them never made it to victory at all. And do you know, sadly, there are many people who do believe in Jesus and will go to heaven but will never, ever, ever enjoy victory here in the earth. Do you know that? You don't have to have victory to go to heaven. You're saved by the blood of Christ. But to enjoy your journey, you need victory. And I think to be a proper witness to anybody else, they need to see it working in your life. Amen. Amen. So the first thing that I saw that they did was they did not have a positive vision for the future. They were always talking about the past. They thought their past dictated their future. And I'm here to tell you that no matter what has happened to you in the past, no matter what is going on in your life right now, it has no power to keep you from having an amazingly awesome future if you will learn to see in the Spirit. The Bible says in Isaiah 11 that Jesus did not see and decide things by the hearing of his ears and the sight of his eyes. He saw with spiritual eyes and he listened with spiritual ears. And we all have ears on our head and eyes in our head, but we also have spiritual ears and eyes. With our natural eyes, we see what's going on around us. We see what's happened in our life. But with our spiritual eyes, we see what we can't see with these eyes. We look with an attitude of faith and we say, God says I can have a good future and I believe that I can have a good future. Recently I was in a Starbucks in some place in Utah and a woman recognized me and began to talk to me a little bit and she said, I wrote your ministry and told you all about my problems and so on and so forth and she began to tell me all about her problems. She said, yes, I'll tell you, she said, in my life, I have been thrown under the bus. And of course, I didn't say this to her because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. But when I left, I thought, well, lady, I've been thrown under the bus too. But now I'm driving it. <laughs> Amen. Well, she just stopped and I've been thrown under the bus. And I can tell you, she will be sitting somewhere telling somebody the same sad story a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, only her story will get more and more bitter and will sound worse and worse because she had no hope for change in her life. And I tried to tell her a little bit, well, God can change things. You need to, you need to trust God. You need to believe in God. And all I got back every time was, was some kind of a wall or some kind of an excuse. Her case was a special case. It wasn't like any other case. There was nobody that had it as bad as her. She got thrown under the bus and all four wheels were sitting on her and she did not have any intention of getting out from under the bus. Well, I decided to drive the stupid bus. And you can do the same thing. But let me tell you something. This is not something that somebody else can decide for you. 
This is something you have to make your mind up to. I'd like us to look as an example at Genesis chapter 13. We see a man there, Abraham, who lost everything, and yet he ended up with more than he lost. Do you know that in God's economy, you can lose every single thing that you have, and if you learn to see with the eye of faith, you can end up with more than you gave up. Job lost everything, had such terrible troubles, and in the end, God gave him twice as much as what he had lost. Abraham had blessed his nephew Lot by sharing what he had with him. And then they both became so prosperous, they had so many cattle and so many employees that they weren't getting along together. The employees weren't. And so Abraham went to Lot, took the initiative, wanted to be a peacemaker, and he said, I beg of you, let there be no strife between us. You decide which part of the land that you want, and I'll take what you don't take. Now, I think that's a pretty amazing, humble attitude right there, because I would have said, I'm going to take what I want first, and you can have what was left, because you wouldn't have had anything if I wouldn't have given it to you. But Abraham was obviously a godly man, probably one of the reasons why God was able to make a covenant with him and use him the way that he did. So sure enough, if you, if you read chapter 13, Lot chose the best portion of the Jordan Valley for himself, and Abraham had to take the leftovers. So he wasn't in very good shape. But in verse 14, it says, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had left him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for the land which you see I will give to you and to your posterity. And in verse 17 it says, arise and walk through the land, the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. So he's saying two things here, both are equally important. First he said, Look, north, south, east, and west, and everything you can see, I will give it to you. Now, he was obviously telling him to look with his natural eyes, but I believe that God wants to say to you tonight, look into the future, and what do you see by faith for your life? Can you see yourself being out of debt? Can you see yourself owning your own home? Can you see yourself with a new car? Can you see yourself with a better job? Can you see yourself being a blessing to many, many, many people? Can you see yourself having, can you see yourself living your dream, whatever that dream might be? As long as it's God's dream too, you can live that dream. Can you see it? If you cannot see it, you will never have it. Then he said to him, and whatever you see, I will give it to you. Now you go and walk it out you go take it. That means you got to take some action. I had a dream, a God-given dream to preach the gospel. It was something God birthed in my heart the first time that I heard a teaching cassette tape back in 1976. I just was so amazed that somebody could take one scripture out of the book of Mark and preach for almost a whole hour on it and keep your attention. And just this burning desire came in me to preach the gospel all over the world, which was very stupid considering where I was at at the time. So it had to be God. I mean, I was not, let's just say I was your least likely candidate <laughs> to be doing that. So God will put things in your heart that do not make any sense to your mind. That's why you cannot live out of your unrenewed mind. You have to live in the mind of the spirit. God will show you things that are possibilities for you, but you, when you read the Word, you have to take it that it's for you. Not just that it's for this special group of some special people, but every promise in the Word is for you. They're all for you. God wants to bless you. God wants to promote you. God wants to raise you up. God wants to use you. God wants to heal you. Amen. But you have to see that 
And you can't wait to see it with these eyes before you believe it. You have to see it with your spiritual eyes and then eventually you'll see it with these eyes. I live in Missouri, which is called the show me state. But in God's economy, you have to believe it first, see it with the eye of faith, and then eventually you'll see it in the spirit. But also, even though by faith, I claimed what I believed that God had spoken to me and given me. I claimed the promises as mine. I still had to go in and possess that land. Now, the word possess is an interesting word because if you study it, it means to dispossess the current occupants and then take the land. So there were enemies in the promised land and they didn't want to deal with the enemies. So they would not go in. They just kept wandering around and around waiting for God to do something about the enemies before they would go in and take what God told them to take. Now here's an interesting point. Actually, in two years, they made it to the border of the promised land. And if I took you to Deuteronomy chapter 1, which I think I will right now. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1 for a second. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 20. And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Ammonites, which the Lord your God gives us. This is Moses saying this. Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. And the Lord, the God of your fathers, has said to you, Fear not, neither be dismayed. Then you all came near to me and said, Let us send men before us that they may search out the land, that they may bring us word again by which way we should go up and into what cities we shall come. And the thing pleased me well, and I took 12 men of you, and I sent you in. These are what we call the 12 spies who went in to check out the promised land. And sure enough, verse 25 says, they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, it is a good land which the Lord your God gives us. Watch verse 26, yet you would not go up, <laughs> but you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. Now I don't have time to go through all this, but later they decided, well, now we will go up. And God said, no, don't try to go in now because now I'm not with you. You should have went when I told you to. And so then they were on the border of the promised land when God told them, now's the time to go in and possess the land. They would not go in. They rebelled against the Lord and they wandered around for another 38 years out in the wilderness and many of them died out there. Now I want to teach you a little lesson tonight. When God tells you it's time to deal with something, <laughs> when God tells you it's time to deal with something, then there's an anointing on it to deal with it then. And you can't put it off till a more convenient time or a time when you think it's going to be easier or a time when you feel like you're ready because then you may decide, well, you know, I'm really tired of putting up with this. I think I'll deal with it now. Well, you might find that God's not got that anointing on you at that time. We have to learn when God touches things in our life that we need to take it seriously. If you know God's dealing with you about a bad attitude, then deal with it. If you know God's dealing with you about unforgiveness in your heart, then deal with it. Don't make some silly excuse about how hard it is to forgive people. I'll tell you what's hard, hating people. That is much harder than forgiving people. Forgiveness is easy compared to hatred and bitterness and resentment and being full of that poison all the time. If God is dealing with you about a habit that you have, that is a destructive habit, if God is putting his finger on it, then you do not have to even think that you can't do it because God is never going to deal with you about something without giving you the ability to go all the way through to victory. But you got to believe it. Well, I'd like to share something with you that came in by email. Carl writes in from Wisconsin and says, by the time I was in the ninth grade, I was running from life's difficulties. Kids picked on me at school because I was small. My grandpa had given me my first drink at the age of nine, so I quickly fell into addiction and landed in prison for seven months. 
Years later, I saw Joyce speak at a conference and have listened to her program ever since. I have learned how amazing a Christian life is when you walk in the fruit of the Spirit and study the Word of God as a way of life. And I'm emphasizing that, studying the Word of God as a way of life. You know, to, remove, to renew your mind is to forget your past and put your spiritual eyes on and begin to start walking in the Word of God. Well, I'm here in Sri Lanka, and with me are some medical professionals that have volunteered their time to come here and help hurting people. And if you're a medical professional, a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, pharmacist, a chiropractor, please consider volunteering to come and help people who otherwise wouldn't have any help. So what do you think? Is this a good thing to do? Yeah! <laughs> 